The next part of uh, the joint presentation is going to be industry perspective on bridge joints. So do we have John Manning, Watson Bowman, Matthew Kielsen of R.J. Watson, and Phil Benavides of MCO. Come on up. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Manning. I'm with Watson Bowman. Uh, I didn't have a chance to do a little bit of a briefing on me. I've been with Watson Bowman uh, approximately 24 years and uh, in the job capacity of technical service manager, field service manager. So primarily my, my job is to go out to job sites and uh, work with contractors and engineers and DOT professionals to make sure that the expansion joints are uh, being installed properly. And to that note, here's my opening slide. <laughs> the expansion joint didn't fail you you failed the expansion joint. So I know my two predecessors up here before that will probably maybe agree or disagree with that, and those were two great presentations they did prior to me coming up here also, but uh, it's, it really is, we're giving it to you from a uh, material supplier's perspective here and what we see every day out in the field. And I'm gonna talk briefly about, and so are my uh, friends right here, we're gonna talk about the basic installations, the preparedness, the preparation, the installation part, the seal sizing, and what if, ands, or buts about uh, expansion joints. So I, I like this one, I hope everybody got a chuckle out of that, but there is a lot of truth to that. And every one of those pictures is a failed system, and that failed system always has a story, right? There's our story, there's the contractor's story, and then there's the DOT story. And the truth of the matter is, yes, as a material uh, supplier, yeah, we do have issues from time to time with materials. I'm not, you probably never heard that before from a material supplier, but I'm here to tell you that we do have problems. Everybody does, every uh, company does. But it really is a small percentage of the time. We find, from our standpoint, that probably as high as 97, 98% of the time, it really is a field issue or something along that line. So maintenance and design requirements of expansion joints cannot always be met. Really very true. Uh, true words have never been spoken. And uh, the reasons we find, and here are some of the key bullet points to that, is these bullet points outline the problems we've seen year after year and time after time out in the field working with expansion joints and contractors in the DOTs. And there's a lot of good points that my, my counterparts are gonna to touch base on here, like lack of seal knowledge. And, but my, when I see the biggest problem out in the field, one of the biggest things I see, and I think uh, my two predecessor speakers right here were talking about it was, is lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge and understanding of, uh, of expansion joints. And that one expansion joint takes care of everything. Right, that's why there's a lot of different expansion joints for small movement and large movement. And the biggest problem I'm getting back to here, and I'll probably talk about it a little bit later also real quick, is it's the absence of proper supervision and the absence of understanding and knowledge. Those are probably the two biggest factors that I see out there in the field. So, applying the procedures and the standards is very important. The other one I wanna to touch base on right here is supervising less qualified workers at the work site being done. I don't blame the contractor a lot of times. One of the big issues I see is, because I work with contractors all the time, there's a lot of great contractors out in the industry. And there's some poor ones out there, unfortunately. So they have a work crew out there of three, four, or five people, and all of a sudden their supervisor takes off and they're told what to do. Well, they're gonna do what they're told what to do, whether they know what they're doing or not. Go fill that hole. Okay, I'm gonna go fill that hole. Go take care of that problem, go prep that but they don't have the understanding and the knowledge and the know-how on what the proper procedures are. And it really comes down to procedures. Uh, here's some of the big institutions in, inside the industry for concrete. ICRI is a really big uh, institution, ACI. I just wanted to kind of throw these up here. These are all really good bullet points. If you get a chance, maybe later on, you can look some of these up. There's really good information. And, it's all about procedures, right? How do we fix things? What's the proper technique? What's the right type of material? What's the proper prep to the substrate? Whether it's steel or concrete, whatever the case may be. These standards already exist. And believe it or not, a lot of people in the industry have never heard of these. So these are really good points to look up when you get a chance. Proper prep. 
uh, prep, prep, prep. Every time I give a presentation, I always talk about prep, and I just say prep, 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 and it's so true, because as far as I'm concerned, that is public enemy number one for expansion joints, is preparation, and for uh, headers. The most common uh, means you're going to see out there is abrasive blasting or sand blasting. There are grindings also acceptable, and there's water blasting, there's acid etching, and the list goes on and on and on. But from a standpoint, from a, a material standpoint and an installation standpoint, I find that abrasive blasting or sand blasting is always the preferred method, always does the best job, always try to do that when you can. I understand there's conditions and times when you can't do that. A grinder is probably my second preferred method with either a Zec wheel or a diamond cup wheel if you're working on a concrete substrate. But when it comes to steel, bottom line, sand blasting is the only way to get that clean. Uh, you'll notice on the bottom right-hand corner, those are profile chips. Those profile chips are one of those bullet points I showed before. That's from iCry. It tells you every expansion joint, every header has a different requirement for surface prep. And those chips right there go from zero to 10 and show you what type of profile you really need on that substrate. And it's a nice thing to have handy in the show to a contractor and say, I'm looking for a CSP profile two or a CSP profile four. And that basically means just concrete surface profile. So it's a very visual effect for them to look at. So it's always nice to have that handy and uh, so they can understand that. And I always like to try to put it in layman's term. Zero would be like a, one would be like a desktop and 10 is a quarter inch or greater in, uh, in the concrete. Okay. So I always tell my contractor friends out there, take a look at everything. Here's a little prep repair matrix that I like to run by and use when I'm out in the field. If there's a problem, determine the problem or problems, right? Take a look at the existing conditions. Evaluate the cause if there's any issues or if there's been failures in the past or causes. Engineer appropriate solution. That doesn't mean you gotta sit down with an engineer and go through a thing and come up with a great solution, put it on a blueprint and bring it out the field and go, hey, Sometimes it's just as easy as following an ACI guideline or an iCry guideline and say, this is what they recommend. We keep on getting spalls. We keep on getting blowouts. Let's follow these guidelines and see how they work. Okay. Complete preparation, no shortcuts. Another big problem I see out in the field is uh, they take shortcuts when they can, and that's, there may be many reasons for that. Time constraints. Uh, they don't have enough material on the job site. Lack of understanding how preps and procedures take place. Right? I see it all the time out there, and it's very important that the contractor understand the proper applications of every single type of material. And this, what this does, it gives you a complete long-term repair or replacement out there 99% of the time when you have the basic understandings for that. Here's just an illustration on a profile of a concrete substrate. And the one to the left on the top is just like a CSP1 profile. And after it's been sandblasted or abrasive blasted, you can see all the ups and downs and inter, uh, incre 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 ah, ups and downs and uh, curves inside the uh, concrete substrate. And what that does is it's actually profiling that substrate. So if you took a look at that bottom line, it's really, even though it's the same length, <clears throat> you have a bond line, a mechanical bond line, now twice the length of your original uh, start, starting point because you profiled that concrete substrate. Really important for uh, headers and also for sealants that uh, rely on an epoxy bond uh, to a substrate. Okay, uh, going into uh, seal installation real quick. I like to have a little pre-job survey or checklist I have all these bullet points are, to me, important elements that a contractor, even a DOT or an inspector should have with them and saying, are all our ducks in a row, are all our I's dotted and our T's crossed, do we have all this pertinent information on hand before we pull up, pull it out onto the job site, sit out there and say, okay, let's go, and then you forget, well, I don't have enough material with me, we didn't bring the right equipment with me, so on and so forth. <clears throat> Another big, uh, and it was talked about a little bit earlier, is uh, manpower requirements and also uh, having a technician on, on the job site. You know, obviously, 
as a manufacturer, we can't have a technician on every job because we just don't have that many people employed, right? It's not viable for us. But we're there for you and we can have a technician when scheduled properly to be out there to help supervise the installation. And it's always, always a good idea to have that because number one reason, we want to protect our name and our interest also. So we really find it important to be out there. Okay, uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of training courses out there that we offer to our, to our customers. We offer it to the DOTs, we offer it to the bridge maintenance crews, to the bridge authorities across the country. We do presentations all the time for them. All you have to do is call up and request. We'd be happy to come out and certify your people, not necessarily certify, but train them on our particular products to make them more knowledgeable. More basic installation procedures to follow is inspections of the joint. Make sure that you inspect the joint when you go out there. It takes a couple of minutes. To, first thing I do, I come out to the job site, I walk down that joint line, I do a thorough inspection. It takes me five minutes. I can tell you in the first five minutes whether we're gonna have an issue or not. Typically nine out of 10 times. And then if there is, we address it. We address it properly following the guidelines that I re presented earlier. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, on to my counterpart. Uh, I appreciate your time. They're gonna deliver a little bit more on uh, seal sizing and more information on expansion joints. <coughs> Thanks, John. I'm Phil Benavides. I'm with MCL Joint Systems. And again, I'm gonna be talking about proper sizing of bridge expansion joints. So we're gonna look at considerations from a few different uh, ecosystems. The design, the repair, and rehabilitation. So design, you know, that's a great opportunity to, uh, to design out problems early on before there's people, money, and uh, time uh, against you. Uh, for repair and re rehabilitation, for this presentation, I'm just gonna define repair as ripping out a seal, replacing it with either a new seal or a new product, no intervention on the substrate, and then rehab is taking advantage of the opportunity to uh, re-pour that joint to a specific width. So bridge design considerations, the theoretical movement, the thermal theoretical movement combined with the, the product that you're, that you're selecting for that joint, once those two things match up, your, your known movement of the joint and the ability of that product to satisfy that movement is hands down the key performance indicator of whether or not uh, a joint is gonna move. And I, I know that sounds silly to say out loud, but that is one of the <clears throat> issues from a manufacturing perspective that we see all the time where a product will get a black eye or uh, a bad name because it was put in, in the wrong situation. Uh, and that goes right into the material limitations. There is no silver bullet. Uh, and then some other things to consider with a, a joint seal. We tend to think in that two-dimensional thermal movement, uh, but there's also depth concerns and there's also other dynamic movements that can impact the success of a joint. So we'll talk about that as well. So that calculated thermal movement, um, that's done on paper. You know, there's, it's a nice, neat environment where things are linear and things are predictable. And, and we know there's other factors that impact overall joint movement. So field, field verification is something that, uh, as manufacturers, we definitely push. A, you want to make sure what you designed is actually what ended up being constructed. Uh, and field verification can solve a lot of problems up front. Um, and especially in situations where you have an existing structure where there's time after time, there's failure after failure, which we get calls on all the time. Hey, this, we put this in, it failed the, the next year. We put something else in, it failed the next year. Uh, so that's an opportunity to take a step back. And at the Southeast Bridge Preservation Partnership in the joints group, they did mention, hey, maybe we should take an opportunity to see how well we are uh, calculating that anticipated movement. So if you have a failure after failure, uh, maybe Look at the numbers again, but then also take advantage of uh, some low-tech technology, like a scratch plate, to actually get uh, some, some no-kidding readings on what the bridge is doing. And then there's a lot more advanced technology that's available, sensors and monitors that you can use to see what that bridge is actually doing. And you can, granted, it'll be a small sample size over the life of the structure, but it's going to give you some really good data that you can actually use to size appropriately. And then ultimately, you know, we try to avoid extremes. We, I don't want to drive my car 110 miles an hour everywhere I go. 
because uh, my maintenance and replacing parts is gonna, gonna happen a, a lot more often and that vehicle is going to fail uh, sooner than if I kept it nice and easy at 55 miles an hour and ultimately that's what we want to do. We want, don't want to put our products in stress all the time because that's going to limit their life. Okay, I use this example. All expansion joints do the same thing, right? You know, the idea is right, that guy's wearing a helmet, but that is the wrong design. That football helmet is not going to save his life or prevent his uh, melon from getting crushed going off that motorcycle at 55 miles an hour. So I, I use this example, and I'm really glad that Scott mentioned it, um, and his, uh, the research that him and that graduate student did showcased the varying difference that you have in a su success of a product or what is perceived as a good product or a bad product. Um, and I was going to use the example of, of, of an asphaltic plug joint in a DOT out east. Their design team designed it in everywhere, you know, high volume areas, maybe where the movement wasn't appropriate. There were a whole bunch of these systems out in the field, um, and a lot of them were put in situations they never should have been in. Lo and behold, you get a bunch of failures, and then the knee-jerk reaction from that institution is, these things are terrible, we're not going to use them. You know, and it's a, you know, that's like the kiss of death for a manufacturer, which is super unfortunate because you know, each product has its capability, and if it's put in the right place, it can work for you. Um, and you know, that's not, not every product is perfect, and not every uh, manufacturer is created equal, but the point is there's a, a lot of situations uh, from state to state where state A doesn't use a product because they think it's garbage, their neighbors next door with the same climate, uh, similar traffic patterns, uh, have used that product and they love it. So uh, I'm glad somebody else said it before I did. But um, so I would just you know maybe reflect on what your your practices are for products that you like and don't like, and then uh, maybe reach out to a manufacturer because I know that we would bend over backwards to open up a, a, a new market um, if we we're locked out of a state for one reason or another, uh, and then just let the material uh, prove itself. Uh, again, going back to the, the linear movement of, of the thermal expansion, sometimes depth is overlooked. And uh, this example here with the compression seal that had those keeper bars engineered into them, uh, that may be something that isn't addressed early on or in the design stage. And then you don't want to get on, on site, have a bunch of material ready to go, and then they try to put it, the material in, it bottoms out on those keeper bars, and now it's, uh, there's a whole new issue that you have to address. Um, because if it's not addressed early on or that question isn't asked and then addressed appropriately, uh, the contractor is going to do what they're paid to do and they're going to put that, that seal into the hole and they may modify the seal for it to fit, which could impact the performance of the joint. Um, so depth is something that we see that is often overlooked, so I would uh, consider that. Okay, moving on to repair considerations, and again, this is uh, existing condition, no intervention with the joint. Um, and then we'll talk about scope of repairs, which will transition into whether or not this is going to be a repair or a, a repair that requires maybe a change order for, um, for some of the spalling to be repaired or, hey, there turns out that this curb is really deteriorated and we can't actually install the seal uh, with this scope of work. Um, and that's something that, again, the contractor is going to get paid to do what they were paid to do. And if those things aren't addressed appropriately by the organization, you're just going to come back to it next year because that seal instantly failed because the substrate is bad. Anyway, existing conditions. Uh, the condition of the substrate needs to be reasonable enough for a seal to be installed into it. Uh, it can, spalling is something that several products have the ability to handle within reason. Um, that changes our sizing consideration uh, because it's not just that a nice linear joint with a consistent width. Uh, where the spalling is bad, maybe we'll run our calculation at, at, that size, at that size and then run the calculation at the smaller size and make sure whatever we provide is going to work in all those uh, situations and caveat that to the contractor to pay extra attention or to you know, do some other type of method to ensure that that doesn't fail. And then un unique joint conditions like skew, which is not that unique, it's fairly common, but that something like a skew or something like a change in plane on the deck or a change in plane up on the curb is going to impact the sizing um, of your material because the movements are going to be different. The movement on a skew is going to be a little different than a transverse joint. So again, you can't just um,
take that thermal movement calculation and, and just focus on one thing. Uh, you want to take the whole system into consideration. And oftentimes, these bridges are, are, are old enough um, that there's enough experience, especially on problem bridges. One of the things that we like to say in our presentations is insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. So it, putting the same thing uh, into, you know, putting the same material into a joint after it's failed over and over again, you know, seems crazy. Although Tony did mention that they did the same thing twice and the second time it worked out. So I don't know who's crazy, but uh, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of variability in these systems. It's very dynamic. They're not simple. Workmanship is obviously important. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna slow down and just focus on sizing, okay. All right, so change orders. You get a change order, you get a change order. You know, this is like uh, music to a contractor's ear. Um, and this is something that I, I see oftentimes out in the field where there's a resealing job um, that the joint is just garbage. And again, the contractor's gonna do what they're paid to do. And if a, if a change order isn't addressed at the time and you pay that contractor to actually fix that, that joint that's out of the scope of the work for that resealing job, guess what, you'll be there next year. So, um, you know, I'm not telling anybody what to do and I know money is tight, but addressing things early on uh, is going to save everybody a, a lot of time. And again, there's a lot of great contractors that wanna do the right work, but they're, they're not gonna pull money out of their pocket to, uh, to do something that they weren't paid to do, unfortunately. So again, substrate quality is uh, really important. Um, we can handle some spalling, but obviously there's things that are well past uh, their, their serviceability. Uh, excessive variation, there are plenty of products on, on the market that can handle you know, a taper or a variation than a joint width, but extremes are going to cause issues. And then ultimately, you get into this no-go criteria where uh, myself or the gentleman up here has to tell a contractor they can't install something, you slow the job down, you cost them a whole bunch of money, it's, uh, it's something that we, we have to do to, again, protect uh, our product and make sure that you get the product that you um, designed for. But we don't want to, it seems ridiculous that we're that last person. You know, that should, that should definitely be addressed in advance. And the preparation, the getting it done in the design phase is a way uh, to prevent that. Uh, now moving on to rehab, when the joint is, is just well past its Seal ability, you know, you need to rehab that joint. And this is a great opportunity to change that joint width um, to, to make it work with the seal that you're designing for that joint. So the opportunity to, to change the, the movement or the range of that movement with the product that you know is gonna meet that, um, meet that movement criteria is, is awesome. Um, Something that is often overlooked is, are those transitions. The deck will be re-poured, um, but then when you get to the transitions, you're, you're then creating another problem. But uh, at MCL, we like to use the mantra, resize, rebuild, reseal. Again, when you rebuild and resize, the movement of that joint, um, you can you know, do some things to close, to close up the joint or, or make it wider, but ultimately that movement is going to be the same, but you can set it so it goes up or down and then you can get a product that is going to meet and exceed that range. So if you're having problems with the joint because it's either too small or too large, um, there's an the opportunity to move that slightly to get your product to work. And that's customizing your seal to your joint or your joint to your seal. And that can solve a lot of problems and ensure that you have a long lasting joint. It's the equivalent of your hardware you know, being designed for your software, which is what Apple does and turns out they have pretty good products. So that's a great opportunity. It's obviously very expensive and there's a lot of elastomeric uh, products on the market. Finding the right one that works for you is important. Um, but monolithic concrete works really well. That's a pref preferred as well. Um, but obviously that's very expensive, but the idea is to, to resize and rebuild to get a very long lasting joint. And the last thing I'll talk about is just, again, overlooking the curbs and parapets or those transitions where you've, you know, you've dialed in your joint, you've got your material working for you, and then you get to that curb, and then all of a sudden you've got a change in plane compounded with a change of joint width, and you may have to do, use two different product sizes where you can't splice them uh, if the product doesn't have that capability, or you have to rely on then the workmanship of 
the contractor to make that work uh, and make it watertight. So as far as rehab, that's the number one thing that I see that causes issues with sizing. So again, design, repair, and rehab changes your sizing considerations, but ultimately with expansion joints, size does matter. So with that, I'm Hi, thank you guys. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about some preservation methods here. Uh, and to start, uh, basically I'm going to touch on a lot of what everyone, uh, the past four gentlemen before me have said, as well as just touching on uh, the preservation methods as well. So we'll start with some extreme failures. I'm sure all of you have seen this in the field where joints are just not sized properly. Uh, to preserve that, obviously, you need to inspect. If you go up to a bridge and there is no joint, obviously, that's a telltale sign that there needs to be some uh, address into repairing that or replacing that with a, a new size. Uh, the next couple photos are just going to be some extreme uh, failures that happen when you don't inspect your joints, when you don't take time to actually preserve and maintain the joints. Uh, we did see this a couple uh, presentations ago where if, you're, if your joint is leaking, uh, especially in the northern states where you have calcium salts or, or any sort of de-icing material, you can, uh, uh, you can then in turn uh, corrode your, your uh, beams, your girders, your bearings. Uh, and pretty much everything underlying underneath those those joints. And here's another extreme photo where even the uh, the pier caps are being spalled, and you're all the way down to rebar. Uh, now I, I'm sure this is not on a state bridge, obviously, guys. So this is your this is your county structures, but still, nonetheless, you got to maintain those joints, and you got to make sure that they're not going to corrode underneath. So we'll talk a little bit about some repair procedures as well. When you get out to a gland and it is leaking, uh, you know, what do you need to do? I'll touch on pretty much everyone that has said it's all about service preparation. There are some glands out there that do accommodate uh, repair procedures where you can actually splice the entire uh, a section of joint rather than replacing the entire seal. Uh, so this is also something to consider when you're doing uh, a job or putting a job out for bid to, to see if you can actually splice in case of a potential failure. Maybe there was some sort of uh, failure or, or spalling of concrete where you need a portion, just a, a one or two foot portion spliced and refurbished rather than replacing an entire seal. So that's something interesting to start looking at. Uh, there are also cases where uh, over time glands fail uh, just based on, on weathering. Uh, this is a good time again to, to consider just a repair of that gland rather than replacing the entire joint system. There are some uh, areas where you can just replace different portions with uh, different seals or even just the same seal just to make sure that that seal is completely uh, closed off from all of your elements. Here's another photo of some, uh, just some failure glands that you can see across the board. And, and again, it, it's just to show that you don't always need to replace the header material. You can see that that's a really nice uh, concrete uh, overlay system there. You don't need to replace the entire system. And that's what brings me there to the replace system. Uh, if you have armored glands or, uh, or elastomeric glands or uh, any other type of uh, header materials where uh, the entire system is now being uh, harmed, you then need to address it and you need to create a full replacement. So here you can see uh, there's a nice rusted photo on the side where the entire gland was actually just cut down, this, uh, cut down the entire length of it. That obviously now needs to be addressed. There are some systems that you can actually replace uh, just the gland in, in part or you can take the entire armoring out and then that's obviously more costly. You need an entire block out of material. Uh, some areas like on that photo on the right, the block out has been poured. Uh, that's an elastomeric type header material. A lot of times those elastomeric headers need that proper surface preparation in order to have that good bonding. And you need to make sure that that is the case. I'm pretty much instilling that in. Always have a good surface preparation and good bonding because otherwise there will be failures a year later, two years later, and then everyone will start complaining. 
You can even get header materials where it is brand new on your structure, and yet still during that curing process of that header, you can see that it's not always just extremely uh, straight and, and uniform down the entire length of joint. So there are some systems that can accommodate those types of, of curvatures or, or uh, uh, faultiness, but again, you want to make sure that you have a good installation. And when you have a good installation, everything should be closed up. You can obviously inspect these joint systems and make sure that they're all good. You need to make sure, again, that your inspections are going out there. Uh, our presentation before us, now they have electronic uh, cameras that are going into bridges. That's pretty neat. I never heard about that, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but again, you have to send someone out there to make sure that, uh, you know, and even go under the structure. I know some of them are more difficult than others, but going under the structure just to see if it's a full leaking failure or if it's just a little tiny partial uh, drip down the side that it can be easily patched. Again, that's something that you need to address. It's something that you need to look for. Are there ease of patching certain seals, or do you need to do a full seal replacement? And so with that being said, we have some recommendations. Again, just training those field engineers for inspections, creating these new in, uh, technologies for inspecting them, uh, utilizing all the, uh, all the industry. Making sure that your field conditions uh, are, are actual conditions versus what you're actually seeing on a, on a plan sheet. You also need to uh, follow that proper preparation. It's always going to be something that all of the industry says. If you don't have a good surface preparation, it will not bond properly. Regardless of what type of material you're trying to bond there, you always need a good surface preparation. And then be proactive. You know, talk to the suppliers, talk to the people, the manufacturers, uh, you know, get, get some information from them before, during, after. Uh, if there's something that goes wrong, rather than just throwing that material on the floor and stomping on it, ask us what might have happened, how can we fix this, how can it be addressed? And with that being said, we're always a phone call away. So, that is the end there. Yeah.